Hello everyone, my name is Peter, and this is my cannonball story. Now, before I just jump right into my race across America, I need to start from the very beginning so you can get into my head and understand the method to my madness. From the mental hurdles, it went through planning, choosing the vehicles, building them, and of course, the cannonball run itself. So without further ado, let's start with part one, L plan. Now, right off the bat, I didn't want to just do a traditional run, which is trying to beat the current fastest time. Maybe in the future, but from my first cannonball attempt, I wanted to try something different, a little crazy, and that was to be the first person to complete a nonstop run on a mini motorcycle. Now I'm sure if you are laughing because with just basic math, it's just impossible to do. And also, who would willingly choose to torture themselves in that way? <laughs> but anyways, the obvious issue is speed. Add that with the distance, and that equals, well, you going to an urgent care for hemorrhoids for sitting on a mini motorcycle for so long. But the mini motorcycle I had in mind was my Honda Gram. It has a tiny 125 cc's with four gears and a top speed around 70 miles or so in perfect conditions. But realistically, it cruises about 50 to 55 miles an hour. Now, if you're thinking it sounds a bit crazy to attempt a coast to coast run on a Honda Gram, you are correct, it is crazy. But I am no stranger when it comes to long rides on a small bike. I've already taken my Grom from Texas to Tennessee, Texas to California, and I've done hundreds of thousands of miles in a regular car and truck and camper van. So riding from New York to California doesn't seem that huge of a leap. However, doing it nonstop with only gas stops, now that's where things can get interesting. Also, the average speed of the Grom would most likely be around 50 miles an hour since we have to factor in the little 125cc motor struggling in different elevation changes. So, the average speed of 50 miles an hour over a span of 2,800 miles an hour, well, that would take roughly 56 hours to go from coast to coast. Oh wait, there's more. I didn't even factor in the additional time it'll take to get gas, use bathrooms, and all that stuff. So you get it. It's just not possible to stay awake and alert for that long while riding safely. But I did say I was crazy, and by looking at the thumbnail, you'll know I still use the Grom, but with some help. And this is the part of the story where it changes from my cannonball story to our cannonball story. But from my point of view, the idea has shifted where, what if I had a pace car following me on the Grom? And also, turn this into the first ever tandem run? Sounds simple enough, but in theory, get a team of three where one person's riding, one person is driving, and one person is resting. Now, the routine that we thought of when we were playing Ring Around the Rosie was as follows. The person in the passenger seat would swap with the rider, the rider is now the new driver, and the driver is now the new passenger, where they can rest and relax. As of who fills up the gas? Well, we're thinking the rider that's about to switch will fill up his own gas, and for the pace car, it's whoever is sitting on the side of the gas tank. And then just rinse and repeat every rider change. Sounds simple enough, right? But actually, let's revisit on why we thought this was the optimal rotation. We just basically want to make sure that the most alert person would be riding at all times since it's the most dangerous between the two vehicles. And now you may be thinking, it's also not safe making the tired rider not the tired driver, but this is the best I can think of. And plus, the driver would have access to energy drinks, snacks, and the passenger to keep them awake. But now that leads us up to the next part of the story, and that's part two, choosing the vehicles, choosing the team, and prepping everything. So this part of the story was honestly the most nerve wracking because every decision I made moving forward will cost me money and just time I couldn't get back. But let's revisit the Grom because even with the pace car idea, the Grom is still too slow. It technically doesn't even have the top speed I need since most highways these days have about a 65 mile an hour speed limit and for my previous road trips with the ground, I would average about 50 miles an hour, and that's only taking back roads, side roads, and avoided highways at all costs. But with this trip, avoiding the highway is not an option, which got me thinking, what if the Grom had more power? I would be still on a mini motorcycle, 
but with a bigger engine. So I started diving into the world of swap grounds by joining Facebook groups and checking out on Facebook Marketplace for motors that I could use. I already knew that 300cc motors from the Honda CBRs were quite popular and I also found out there are some wild 700cc swaps out there. But for what I wanted to accomplish, my goal was to find a 250 or 300cc motor and handle the swap myself. But as I dug deeper, I realized it might be more cost effective to buy a Grom that was already swapped, especially since it wasn't riding season at the time and people were willing to sell their bikes at a much lower cost. So after a few weeks of searching, I found a great deal on an SF Grom with a CB250R motor loaded with all the goodies I wanted. So I took a quick day trip to Alabama and picked that up. Unfortunately, a few weeks after I bought that new Grom, I ended up selling my old Avenger Grom to justify the purchase. Goodbye Grom. You've been good. But now that we have our modified Grom, it was time to find a perfect pace car. And here enters the idea of a Japanese mini truck. Now for years, I've always wanted a K truck, but I never had a good enough reason to get one until now. Maybe I'm just reaching to justify buying a K truck, but it honestly seemed like the perfect combo. They're both slow mini vehicles with similar top speeds and with it being a truck, it would be perfect for transporting both the Grom and itself to the starting line, plus driving it back home after the run. Right? It makes sense to me. So now the next challenge, finding the perfect K truck. And this is where I immediately started looking at Honda Actis because the thought of having two mini Hondas together on a cross country trip sounded amazing. But then I quickly learned that the ones that were legal in the US only had about 38 horsepower, three cylinder motor, and a top speed around 71 miles an hour or so. On top of that, it has leaf spring rear suspension and they seem pretty overpriced because how popular they were. So after a few weeks of researching, I decided to go with a Subaru Sandbar. And in hindsight, I am so glad I did. But the Sandbar stood up because it has a four cylinder motor that's located in the rear for easy access for repairs and with a top speed of 87 miles an hour. It also has independent rear suspension and is one of the larger cabs compared to the other brands. Now that I figured out what I wanted, I started to search all over the internet and I stumbled across the perfect one on a site called carfromjapan.com. At first I was hesitant because this truck was located in Japan and I've never imported anything before. But you gotta start somewhere. So I YOLO'd it, bought it, and I told them to ship it to Freeport, Texas. Fortunately, the import process was pretty straightforward since I hired a US customs broker to handle all the paperwork. So while I was waiting for the mini truck to arrive to the US, it was time to find my team. I needed two more people that could drive stick, ride a motorcycle, and of course, that's crazy enough to suffer with me. And that's where I immediately reached out to my buddy Jeremy and Lucas. Now, the reason why I chose them, well, it's because we've already had a successful motorcycle trip through the Tail of the Dragon and the Blue Ridge Mountains. On top of that, we're all already good friends that's gone on many trips together, so I figured we'd be a pretty solid team for this challenge. But four months later, the truck arrived to the US and my girlfriend and I hopped on a plane from Chicago to Dallas where our team member Jeremy picked us up since he lives in Texas. From there, we drove five hours south to the port and well, I can go more in detail about this adventure in a future video if you're interested, but to keep it short, we picked up the mini truck, drove it to Dallas, registered it since I'm a Texas resident, did some maintenance like oil changes, spark plugs, filters, and then we drove it all the way back to Illinois. Now, if you're curious why, it's because at that time, I was living in Illinois, building out a camper van with another buddy. Oh, and along the way, I did a little side quest. I proposed to my girlfriend during a hike we had in Arkansas. She's always been super supportive, up for wild adventures, so the idea of proposing to her on a trip with a very uncomfortable small truck that we didn't know was gonna make it back home seemed like the perfect proposal for us. But after completing that side quest, we made it back to Illinois without any issues at all, and I was a very happy man with a very happy fiance. So now that we had all the vehicles secured, the team, and also we figured out a date, it was time to put my head down and spend the next few months prepping everything. Now, other cannonballers' usual concerns are 
a fast, reliable car that can be fitted with the largest fuel cell possible, and of course, the police. But for us, it was purely just reliability since we're not breaking any speed limits and we just need to get across the country safely in one piece. For the mini truck, it's 31 years old, it's carbureted, it wasn't designed to go on the highway. And for the Grom, it has a swap motor, so reliability is key. But even though I just mentioned reliability for the Grom, I wasn't actually too worried about the motor itself since it's still a Honda. But I did take apart the bike to make sure the swap was done correctly, did some basic maintenance, and I also found a guy named Paul to expand the capacity of the fuel tank, making it an extra gallon. It's not much, but better than nothing. However, my main goal was to turn the bike into an adventure ground like my last one. So I had some new things like a new mirror, headlights, a windscreen, a dash cam with Apple CarPlay, and a bunch of other stuff. I also had Ken from IKG Moto to double check all my work and correct anything I missed. Thanks again, Ken. Now the K truck, well, that's a different story. These trucks just aren't built for long highway stretches. So I was worried that it might overheat and blow up if I'm being honest. To avoid that, I tried making it as reliable as possible with the budget that I had. So I put on bigger wheels and tires, replaced the brakes, the muffler, and did other maintenance like head gasket, water pump, timing belt, thermostat, belts, fluids, you got it. Basically just a long laundry list of things that a 31 year old truck probably needs. But again, keeping the truck from blowing up was my main concern. So I added an oil cooler and upgraded the radiator fan. Also through my Facebook group, I met a guy named Nick. And Nick runs a fabrication shop out of Texas. And he's been a huge help. He fabricated me a rear bumper bar that replaced my old engine cover that basically acted like a parachute. He also fabricated me a top engine cover with a cutout of a 10 inch radiator fan. My plan with that fan was to use it whenever the truck was idling or in stop and go traffic just to keep airflow going to the motor. Nick also had a brilliant idea of adding a mister system to the radiator because race truck. So I repurposed one of the windshield pumps from the truck and replaced the line with one that had a bunch of missing nozzles and I zip tied it to the radiator. Simple as that. Now, did it keep the engine temperatures down? I don't know, but you'll have to wait to find out. But that's about the major things I did to both vehicles and I'll go more in depth of each setup in future videos. But now the prep is done and it's time for part three, the adventure to New York. Now, since I had the main truck, I opted to drive to New York instead of shipping everything. So because of that, I lowered the Grom on the back of the truck and I set off on the 800 mile journey to New Jersey since it was cheaper to stay in New Jersey than New York. Wow, that was a mouthful. But anyways, I left on a Sunday, made a pit stop in Cleveland for a night. I think I got the furthest room ever. It's like leg day right now. <laughs> Met some cool people in Pennsylvania on the Monday and rolled into New Jersey that night. As soon as I arrived, I did an oil change in the hotel parking lot, and then I let the K truck and myself rest for the next 48 hours. On the morning of the fourth day, I picked up Jeremy from the airport, followed by Lucas a few hours later. We hit up Costco for supplies, got some gas, had a beer, and did some last minute planning. But our plan for the rest of the day was to take a power nap, wake up at 2 a.m., and then head towards the Red Ball Garage by 3 a.m. At this point, I was honestly a bit of a mess. I was so focused on getting the vehicles all sorted that I neglected the electronics I needed to record the entire trip. Yes, I did have 48 hours at the New Jersey hotel, but nonetheless, that left me up to around midnight getting only about two hours of sleep. Whew, man, I'm already exhausted telling you guys this story and the cannonball run hasn't even started. But this is why I wanna share and give you a backstory to give you an idea of the effort that it goes in prepping something like this. And believe me, I'm leaving a lot of it out. But now it's on to the part that you're really interested in and that's part four, the cannonball run. And well, how it all went down. Now day four started off very slow as none of us had much sleep, but we got ourselves together, went down the elevator, went through the hotel lobby, got the vehicles all set and prepped, and then we were finally on our way. While we were on our way to the Red Ball Garage, we made sure that everything was strapped down properly in the back of the truck, and we also checked all our comms and recording gear. Of course, when we got to the starting line, the SD card in the GoPro was already corrupted, but thankfully I had a backup ready to go. Also, when we arrived to the garage, is when I started to get very anxious. Knowing that we're finally here, it's finally happening, and a million things are going through my head. But it was go time, now or never, so we had a quick pep talk, took some photos and videos to document the start, and counted down from three, two, 